Welcome to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. My name is Michael Butler. Thanks a lot for joining me. I really appreciate it. What you're listening to in the background is, of course, The Darkness. I believe in a thing called love. You either love or hate this band. I don't know anybody who feels in between, but I am one of those people who actually loves this band. That's Permission to Land Record. It's one of my favorite albums probably in the last 10 years. But something happened. They weren't the same when they did that second album. What happened was they kicked their, their bass player out, Frankie Pullane, and I thought that guy kind of added to their whole image and everything. And in honor of this record, Permission to Land, that Frankie Pullane is on, I'm going to be playing an interview I did with Frankie Pullane. I interviewed him last week. He has a book out. It's kind of a combination tell-all rock biography and self-help book. And it's done with a tongue-in-cheek sense of humor. It's a good interview, but you're going to have to listen very closely because he called from Ecuador and a combination of the bad phone connection and his thick Scottish accent along with my thick southern accent it's you're just gonna have to listen closely so the potential for a train wreck is there but listen closely and I think you're gonna enjoy this interview I'm gonna intersperse it with some darkness tunes as well some of my favorite songs from the permission to land record he's a good guy he had to, he come he not, doesn't take anything really too seriously and it was an honor for me to talk to the guy. So without further ado, I'm going to let this song roll, and then we'll go right into the Frankie Pauline interview. Let me know what you think of this interview and all the other shows that I do at rockandrollgeek at gmail.com is my email address. Leave me an audio comment, area code 706-621-ROCK. And don't forget to support the sponsors. That's the best way to support my show. Go to the show notes at rockandrollgeek.com and click any of the sponsor links, and I get a little bit of a kickback, and I really appreciate it. So without further ado, here is the Frankie Pullane interview. Oh, by the way, his book is called Dancing in the Darkness, and I will post links to where you can buy it at rockandrollgeek.com, as well as where you can purchase some darkness music as well. So enjoy the interview, and enjoy the darkness music, my friends. Here you go. Hi there, it's Frankie Pullane here. Hey, Frankie, how's it going? Good, man, good. Thanks a lot for coming on my show. I really appreciate it. Hey, no problem. <laughs> I'm actually in uh, Ecuador. Oh, now. really? What are you doing in Ecuador? Uh, just visiting, uh, uh, learning how to surf in a place called Montanita. Oh, do you live in Ecuador now? Um, I'm, no, I'm, I've been on a, a three-month trip uh, to Brazil, Venezuela, and now Ecuador. Do you, are you there by yourself? Are you with your girlfriend or what? Um, yeah, I'm just with friends, you know. Uh-huh. I'm, an, I'm with a Polish cleaner, the the one in the book. Oh, you're, oh, is she your girlfriend? Um, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, more, um, more of a kind of uh, soulmate. Yeah. And Anya, how do you pronounce her name? Anya? Um, Anya. Yeah. Anya. Yeah. yeah, she looks good in the picture on yeah. the back of the book. I read the book. I thoroughly enjoyed the book, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> Great. Yeah, well, it was, uh, it was quite hard work to, to write, so... Well, someone once said that um, writing a book is uh, hell, but uh, finishing a book is uh, paradise. Did you write it yourself, or did you have anybody helping you write it besides Anya? Yeah, yeah, I just wrote, I wrote it myself. Yeah, just uh, myself and Anya kind of uh, uh, threw a bit of gold dust at it and did the drawings and everything. All, although, actually, in terms of the actual order of the book, it was actually the, the sketches first, you know, the little um, drawings which inspired the book. Right. There's got like all kinds of stick figures and stuff in it. Did Anya do those? Yeah, well, she did those, and that kind of uh, inspired the idea of doing a book based around it. It was structured like a self-help book, and uh, it was hopefully uh, more than just a run-of-the-mill kind of mem- you know, rock and roll memoir, which yeah. I think you know everything's been said about that kind of thing. So I like to do something that's a bit more philosophical and uh, uh, delve a bit deeper, and just hopefully a bit more irreverent also. Yeah, it's kind of like it, I, what I like about it is it's got a tongue-in-cheek sense of humor, and plus it's you know, it's informative, and you don't t- you don't seem to take everything too seriously, you know. Well, hopefully not. Thanks. Yeah, um, that's the idea. You know, is uh, it's kind of poking fun really at uh, the fact that um, an awful lot of people uh, reveal a side to themselves, which is quite vain and egotistical in this situation, you know. Right. And we don't see that like like an awful lot of people have toured and been in a big rock band, you know they completely divorced from reality. You know, they're kind of incubated anyway the whole time uh, from reality when you're uh, famous in any way, really. Uh, so um, I'm glad, actually, that I waited um, a little bit, uh, a couple of years, you know, until I kind of uh, actually finished it because um, 
you know, when it's when you just come up here or you've just been involved in a messy breakup, you know, you haven't got such a kind of good perspective. Yeah. To approach that kind of thing. Did you get any like flack from people in the darkness camp about? Did, did they find out that you were writing the book before you wrote it? Uh, well, apparently the guitarist uh, Dan, uh, he, he's kind of uh, fuming. Um, uh, but uh, Justin actually has been through uh, uh, the party clinic, you know, the clinic for uh, in England, it's quite famous one actually, the, the celebrities go to uh, sure. to uh, cure, cure themselves. Uh, uh, but anyway, you know, he's been through the 12 steps and everything because he was a proper kind of alcoholic and cokehead. So he, he, was, he was actually happy for me to uh, to um, show some of the stories, to uh, show what people are like in their... Uh, messed up and also you know he's got a good attitude now he's got a healthier approach to life he's a little bit kind of uh, born again you know um, and he's uh, got a sense of humor back which is fantastic because he's not touched a drop of alcohol or a granule of cocaine for um, I think one and a half years now so so we're actually in touch with email which is great so you've actually talked to Justin since you were since you've written the book yeah, 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 and he's okay with it, you know. Um, I mean, you know, because I don't know, all I do is just tell a few uh, stories of uh, things that, you know, he got to, you know, when he pissed himself on a Japanese air flight and uh, sold his uh, beloved uh, Max, Max Fun costume. Yeah. Um, or uh, when he uh, uh, trashed uh, the hotel in Germany with uh, Drummer Red, et cetera, et cetera. So he's fine with it. He, he's fine because he's got good, good perspective. But the other two are a bit more sensitive, I'd say. But that's just, you know... You have to uh, break a few eggs to make an omelet, don't you? Well, in the book, you don't really trash anybody in the band, but it is quite informative. You're, what you're referring to is Justin bought. I ha- have a hard time understanding your, the um, the thick accent, so I apologize if I don't say everything right. But uh, what you're referring to is when Justin bought this microphone costume and got drunk on the plane and pissed in it, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Not deliberately. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, uh, um, that was at, um, uh, when he was um, in the middle of uh, Barney, as we call it in England, uh, meaning a um, uh, domestic kind of argument with his partner, the band's manager, Sue Whitehouse. Right. And he's, be- he's basically um, out of air- every day in Japan, uh, lived there for a week, and um, then uh, um, he found a microphone costume, a human microphone costume, uh, and he wore it, and it, uh, well, he put it on as soon as we got on the plane um, back to the UK, um, this beautiful silver mic- uh, microphone costume, and then was, was um, staggering up and down the um, aisle um, in, Jap- in uh, Japan Air, upper class, and then uh, he... Um, I was leaning at one stage. He was leaning against the exit door handle while these polite stewardesses, uh, um, you know, the Japanese people can often be a bit too polite, and not just not just too sure how to deal with people in these situations. Um, so, so they uh, shoved him back to his seat, and then he fell asleep, sat a snoring, and uh, pissed himself. Yeah, you mind if I ask you some darkness questions? Because oh, yeah, it's all fun. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. No so everybody wants to know. I, I I told everybody who I know that is a fan of the darkness that I was interviewing you, and they were all. And the first thing they all asked was, "What happened? Why did he get kicked out of the band?" And you were kind of a little bit vague in the book about the real about exactly what happened when you got kicked out. All I all I got out of it was, Justin said, "Hey, it's either Frankie or me, and you guys are going to have to decide." So, uh, what was the real reason that you got kicked out? <laughs> The other reason um, was um, that, um, uh, well, <clears throat> we grew uh, separate, really, because uh, I, I wasn't really into uh, the, um, the whole coke thing, you know, getting cooked up every night and uh, kind of getting into the same kind of behavioral patterns. I just find it a bit boring, you know. I mean, I like to have a good time. I like to drink and I like to get wasted, you know, as much as the next man. But... I think the cocaine thing, especially with a band like we were, it kind of destroys the sense of humor, um, and, um, and it also kind of affects people's egos. The rest of the band was doing coke, and you were not, and you said, hey, I don't like you guys doing coke, so they said you're out of the band? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't, um, no, it wasn't as simple as that. You know, things never are as simple as that, are they? Um, there's also the issue of, um, there's lots of issues with the management and um uh, Justin being the partner of Sue, yeah. um, the manager, and there's lots of stuff going on, and uh, 
with the backing of the other two band members, the guitarist Dan and the drummer Ed, I um, had um, another accountant uh, just to uh, check out the financial situation and what was going on with the backing of them because they, they, they felt very vulnerable along with myself. And, um, you know, uh, the other two guys didn't really back me up and then just didn't obviously use me as a scapegoat and kind of felt very insecure by that I was doing that. And, you know, it was a few things really, but basically the whole thing just turned a bit sour anyway and the second album uh, wasn't as much fun to make because I was involved in the making of the second album. You know, we, we wrote all, all the songs together. But then during the recording of the second album in the studio for a long time with Roy Thomas Baker, yeah, the, uh, mm-hmm. just Queen, yeah, um, and just you know things were just stagnating and all that money was being spent and it was really just a lack of creativity, and then gradually, um, um, <clears throat> you know, that's what happens. People just grow apart, and uh, you know that's kind of what happens. And then Justin made a stand. Um, I made a stand against him. He made a stand against me, and that's kind of what happens. And, but I, I was quite happy really to be in that situation because uh, um, it wasn't really an enjoyable place to be at that time. Do, did you play on that whole record, the second album? No, it was just actually before I was going to record my parts. But, um, you know, the shit hit the fan, as they say. Huh. Um, so um, I think actually Dan eventually played the bass and the guitar parts on the album. What do you think of that second record? Um, second record, um, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great ideas in there, definitely. But I'm not sure if it kind of sits well together, you know, or um, it's maybe kind of overproduced, I would say. How about yourself? What do you think yourself? Well, first of all, I think Permission to Land, in the years to come, will probably be remembered as one of the really great rock records because that record, to me, from top to bottom, that the songs are great on that record, and it seemed like the band was... I could be wrong, but it seemed like they were listening to a little bit of Thin Lizzy, a little bit of ACDC, and they were like anthemic rock songs. And the second album, it seemed a little self-indulgent. The songs are all pretty mediocre, in my opinion. I think you're right. I think you're right. There's something that you can't fake. You know, you can't really fake uh, that vibe on that first album. You know, and you're completely right when you say Thin Lizzy, ACDC, it's feel good kind of stuff. Uh, and it's something you can't fake if you had this really good vibe, you know, going on with us. We'd been through some really hard times, you know, because uh, we'd almost broken up several times. We'd, we, we struggled for a long time to make it, and then somehow we'd fight it. So there's that kind of human spirit, which there is in all kind of good creativity. It doesn't matter if it's, it's coming music or movies or painting or anything. You know, it's the same thing. It's that kind of uh, human spirit overcoming the odds, you know, and really digging deep into yourself. Whereas, like you say, the second one was uh, flatulent and self-indulgent. But, I mean, there's no doubt, in, uh, we can hear that there's talented people involved in the second album. I mean, Justin's a, a, an, an extremely talented guy, you know, uh, as a vocalist, well, writer, g- guitar player, you know. But mm. All the performances are good on that record, and I even don't have a problem with the overproduction. And you know, every but the songs are just not that great. It seemed like the band kind of lost a sense of humor. And I think that Ju- I know that Justin was into bands like Foreigner and things like that. It seemed like he was trying, he was listening to Foreigner after they had gone from playing rock anthems to trying to be a middle of the road, you know, AOR band. And some a lot of the songs are just kind of a little bit dull to me on that record. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what happens. You know, uh, cocaine sucks sucks people's creativity and life force. That's the thing, you know? Huh. It's a bad drug to do, really, for creativity. There aren't many good cooking albums, ever. You wrote in the book that Dan thought, you know, he thought he was Beethoven when he was writing the second record. Yeah, so, well, it was just to get that gag in where he said um, he thought he was Beethoven, but unfortunately it was only the death bit. Right, he's right, he's exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah because, uh, you know, he was like in a world of his own, kind of imagining that he was creating some kind of masterpiece, you know, when he was seeing his guitar parts and everything. You know. It was just, you know, I mean, I like to be philosophical about it, really, in, in the book, in the sense that I'm trying to look at this wider issue of uh, um, when you've got too much choice, you know, I use this expression that um, the trouble with uh, modern life is there's, there's um, only variety and nothing else. Which yeah, is a bit of a kind of paradox, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, when you have too much choice, you're ultimately dissatisfied, and you invariably make the wrong choice. 
Exactly. There's a lot of money, and you got a lot of people giving you different ideas. And when you guys were starting off the first record, you know, there was not a lot of money, and it was probably more hello? of a... Gl- hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello, hello. <laughs> Uh-oh. Frankie? Hey, Michael. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. I'm not sure what happened there. Uh... That's okay. Well, Ecuador to San Francisco is a long way, so... Yeah, but the sound quality is okay, eh? Yeah, it sounds fine. You actually sound a little bit better now mm-hmm. than you did before, so that's a good thing. So I, cool. I was I was talking about you guys... When you were doing the first album, it's probably more of like a gang mentality. It's us against everybody else, and, you know, we're having a good time with this. And didn't really expect to be fam- to. I don't know, you probably expected to be famous. Everybody does. But you didn't really expect to be as huge as you were. And then all this money gets uh, in. Sorry to stop you, uh, mid floor. Sorry, yeah. just to interrupt just to say, but actually, in a way, uh, we, 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 we did actually think it was going to be huge, you know, towards the end of the album and when we, when we recorded it and heard it. You know, that was our intention to do uh-huh, these yeah. but, but anyway, carry on, carry on. Well, when you were actually making videos for that first album, you tell some stories in the book about, you know, the record label started getting involved with their opinions about how you should make the videos and things like that? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, um, I just make the point that uh, um, you should never uh, relinquish control to your um, a- A&R man. Um, because, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, basically we got really busy uh, kind of touring the States and traveling worldwide. And, uh, the, um, you know, we had the sense of fun and this sense of doing things in a kind of fun way. And then what happens is uh, we try to make it more sensible and more like other bands and more homogenous. You know, it's that kind of corporate rock kind of thing. You know, rock has become very corporate, you know, like... You can really get like a thin music existing today because they would just get knocked into a uh, cocked hat. You know, like the, the rock bands now are kind of almost like kind of um, uh, estate agents or something, you know, like Nickelback. And, right, uh, yeah. You know, you know, you don't really, rock bands aren't so freaky anymore, are they? I think in a way we were, we were like a return to those freaky kind of, goofy kind of bands of the 70s, you know? So when so when you guys came up with an idea, did and you would present it to the record label, and they would shoot it down, and you guys would just say, "Ah, okay, that's the record label wants. They must know better than us." Uh, no, no, it wasn't the case of that. We just, you know, it should be just a passing remark here about, uh, you know, for example, uh, "Love Is Only a Feeling," uh, with, uh, which wasn't actually released in the U.S., but uh, um, we did this. Um, we wanted to do like a really silly kind of uh, video, like a concept video. Um, uh, but they, uh, but um, we led to believe that Love Is Only Feeling would be like a U.S. single. So, we, so right. we ended up doing this uh, Guns N' Roses homage on the clip top, which um, none of us wanted to do. Uh, and the single ended up not even being released in the states. And then when it was released in the U.K., people just thought that we'd become uh, really kind of uh, Americanized and lost their identity and everything. So <laughs> it was just, it was just a bit of silly uh, moment. I mean, you know, that was towards the end of the first album. After then, uh, we've done everything ourselves and done all the videos ourselves and had fun. It was packed, and it was a it was a really fun show, man. I had a real a thoroughly good time watching you guys, and it looked like the band was having a good time too. That was actually before the record actually broke in the states. Yeah, yeah, I think I remember that one actually. Yeah, I remember. Um, uh, I remember the amount of groupies in San Francisco. I was surprised by they're very uh, open and very. Uh, uh, forthright, you know, the, the groupies in San Francisco. Was that, does that mean they were easy? Uh, no, well, they just, well, not easy because none of us were particularly interested in sampling them, you know, but just the <laughs> fact that they're just much more open about it and honest about it. Yeah. People were there at that show to have a good time, and I was thoroughly impressed with the show. And, you know, I actually really liked watching you play. When you got kicked out of the band, the, they got the guitar tech to take the place, and there must have been some sort of like, Satisfaction to see that record not really do that well, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, well, in a way, I was hoping it would do well because of the publishing, you know, because I helped write some of the songs. So okay, the publishing right. is yeah. always, uh, yeah, so that's still, a, but you know, yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, you're probably right in the sense that um, everyone likes to feel vindicated, you know, and um, yeah, I get, you know, we were, we were a strange kind of band in a way, maybe it was only meant to last one album, you know, it was uh, a strange kind of, uh, 
I mean, everyone was very surprised during the UK and um, all our friends, you know, when it finally did take off because uh, it's a strange kind of band, really, you know, to approach that kind of music with a sense of humour and to uh, be halfway between that kind of cartoony kind of pastiche and, uh, but then to play it straight too, you know, so no one could decide if it's Final Tap or, um, you know, like, you know, just something more genuine. Yeah, was was the band okay with that? With that, you know, I guess he got kind of labeled as like a novelty band or whatever. Even though there's no denying the quality of those tunes on that first record, did you guys did it kind of get on you guys' nerves after a while when people referred to you as like a novelty act? Um, yeah, yeah, it did definitely. Yeah, because the thing is, everyone likes to put something in a box, and um, I think uh, something is always uh, you're always much fresher when you're not in that box. And as soon as you put you in the box, then uh, it can become a bit stale, you know. And that's how that's when bands become careerist. Yeah, you know, so, I w- uh, it, it was great when people couldn't decide what we were. You know, there's such different opinions. That was really um, enjoyable. I would think that you know when they when they label label you as a novelty act, and you're having a good time, you're not really taking it too too seriously. You have a tongue in cheek attitude about it. It would almost be good to like just go even more over the edge, you know, just to stick it in their face and make me make them even more sense of humor. And that's what got to me is that second record just doesn't seem to have the sense of humor the first record did. No, well, it's true. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Like I said, it's just uh, cocaine, you know, it takes away people's sense of humor. Yeah, so, Ju- so Justin went into rehab. This was after you had left the band, I think. Why do you yeah. think he left the band? Because he... was he so, not getting along no, with Dan? No, well, he felt like, yeah, exactly. He wasn't getting on with him. He wasn't getting on with anyone. That's the thing. Uh, things became even worse, uh, not to me, because at least then we balanced each other out. Um, myself, Dan, and Justin, there was an equilibrium there, you know, through all different personalities, as I go through in the group. But as soon as you take away one person, it becomes unbalanced, you know. What do you think of that band? What do you, what do you think of the Stone Gods? Uh, I'm not a particular fan. Uh, I find that they're too uh, meat and potatoes, as you say. Yes, yeah, kind of. Kind of generic, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Very generic, exactly. It's just generic anything. I uh, just think life's too short, you know? Yeah, do you like Hot Leg? Have you heard them? Uh, yeah, well, they're more fun, aren't they? Definitely. But again, maybe it's a little bit imbalanced again. I mean, take a more chance of doing some good stuff and stuff that makes your um, ears stand up, you know? Um, well, your hair stand up, rather, sorry. Right. Uh, you, you know, because he's a really talented guy, and he's, he's got a really unusual brain, and he's a really good ear for the idiosyncratic kind of side of things. Well, well, I think Justin and Dan were both extremely talented guitar players and songwriters. I'm just, I can't believe that da- Dan just went like a, such a 180-degree uh, turn just from, from catchy tunes to just got c- not good music. It's like almost bad metal. <laughs> You know? I mean, I'm not trying to get you to say anything bad about Dan. I admire your honesty. No, no, I admire your honesty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's true. Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak for Dan, you know, that's the thing. You know, the book's not really about Dan. It's also about, I should add also, the book's also about um, my um, days drug smuggling with my crazy father and my uh, right. brother. Right, right. And uh, it's about quite part of other stuff. You know, the book's only really half about the, the band. At the end of the book, you talk about you're gonna you're maybe gonna go track your dad down after you had written a book and stuff. Did you ever track him down? Not so far. No, I think he might be quite angry with me, to be honest. Oh, why he thinks because you... of uh, yeah, well he's kind of holed up in the Caribbean somewhere, and uh, Britain is quite a bit in you know, based on um, our uh, time drug smuggling together. So I'm not sure that he'd be that happy. Oh, he thinks you maybe told it. We ratted him out for selling drugs. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But the thing is, so much time has passed since then. We're talking like 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, it's a long time. Huh? Yeah, the stories about you and your family and all that growing up are kind of are really interesting, you know, stories of the book. And they're and they're and they, too, are written with a, with a nice sense of humor as well. Yeah, hopefully. One story you wrote in the book uh, about signing people's boobs, you know, you would be at like a, at a signing, right, yeah. girls would pull their boobs out. What I call the, yeah, what I call the boobograph. Yeah, booba graph. And yeah. you t- there was one funny quote in there that said you wanted to go backstage and ask Nelly Furtado to sign your balls. That made, I, I got a kick out of that. <laughs> well, I just figured that as it's an act of giving, uh, and as it's an act of taking, certainly, um, you know, the, the, the girls who are asked to do that, they think they're doing them a favor. 
the National Flag Day are doing you a favor. Exactly. Uh, so, um, you know, to, to pay back, I would like to uh, offer uh, another potato my balls to sign. And there's a story in there. Uh, it was also, yeah, yeah, sorry, it was also tied with the next chapter, which is about the time we were in Detroit. And, yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, which is, I think, what you were coming to, isn't it? <laughs> when uh, um, we were in D- Detroit uh, signing um, CDs. And then a little kid came forward uh, with a stuffed dog, which um, was a memento from his grandfather who hated heavy rock. So when his uh, grandfather died and his grandfather's dog died, this kid had his grandfather's dog stuffed and then brought it to us and uh, wanted us to sign it um, as a kind of, uh, almost like a gesture against his grandfather who hated heavy metal. And then uh, we all signed it and then Ed signed it last and put uh, the E on one bollock and the D on the other. So uh, I, I make the point that at least for uh, at least for one day, uh, Ed really was the dog's bollocks. Also, there's a story about you w- getting into an argument with a guy from the Strokes, and then you guys ended up making up. So you said that you gave he gave you a big hug. I guess after you know they accused you of. Well, you can you can tell if you want to. Yeah, well, basically, uh, it was on the big day out festival in Australia where all the bands uh, threw Australia together. And uh, just in the strokes, and the strokes uh, had been avoiding us for the first three, four days of the tour. And then we found out from someone, you know, some gossip said um, it's because they'd rather we'd been slagging them off in the press back in the UK. So then um, there was no contact made at all. And then one day uh, I bumped into uh, Fab and uh, the singer, uh, what's the singer's name again? I, Julian, yeah. uh, backstage. And they had a security guard with them, and they were walking towards me, uh, very old, twitchy, and really edgy about something. And they uh, tried to uh, shine me down in public and said, you know, you guys are just gay metal. You know, who the hell do you think you're doing anyway? You know, uh, we don't like that kind of stuff. I'm slagging each other off. And I made the point, and I told them it, wasn't, it hadn't come from myself personally, so I couldn't really speak to the other band members. And I thought the Americans invented free speech anyway. Uh, and then um, they, they kind of stormed off and they were all kind of uh, angry and everything. And then um, the next day, uh, Fabrizio came backstage into our dressing room and uh, gave me a big hug and apologized in front of uh, all of us, in front of a big kind of group of us, you know, which I thought was big of him and really cool, you know. And I said, uh, because he was dating um, Drew Barrymore at the time, I said, uh, when he gave me a hug, that practically made me E.T., yeah, you. I I related to that because I stayed in her assistant's house that was owned by her, and I uh, took a dump on her toilet. So I I kind of figured that I kind of rubbed uh, my okay. I kind of okay. rubbed my butt with with Drew Barrymore's butt by association. So so there's one thing in the book that says um, Justin ducked into the to- into a toilet stall with a very famous heavy metal drummer, and you didn't you didn't say who that was. Who was it? Uh, like I've taken out of the last minute, you know, I'm not sure I'm alive, that's the thing. Um, if everyone knows who he is, you know, like the um, the heavy metal drummer who enjoys extra curricular activities the most. Mm. The little guy from, from Scandinavia. From Scandinavia, heavy metal band in Scandinavia. <sighs> uh, no, 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 the drummer's from um, Scandinavian. There's a Scandinavian surname. Oh, Metallica. Okay. Is that it? Yeah, possibly. Okay. Mm, okay. So, what were they doing? They doing doing drugs or having gay sex? Uh, you have to read the book, you know, and then you get the general idea. You yeah, know. I read the book. <laughs> I couldn't figure, figure. I'm guessing they were doing drugs. I mean, not that it matters that they were doing. It's open gay to sex. interpretation. Yeah, it's open to interpretation. You yeah. know, I mean, you know, well, it's the beginning. Yeah. So, you still have your gear, your your equipment, your bases and stuff. Um, I got one of them, yeah, a couple of them kept by the band and sold off and then he did money for the Stone Gods, you know. So, um, but, um, I'm, you know, I've got everything I need and I've got most of my money and everything, so everything's good. So I've been doing a bit of traveling and uh, uh, investing and um, uh, wrote the book, of course, which is really good fun. You have so, to get to the book for just to make people laugh, you know. I just wanted to make people laugh, you know. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I laughed a lot. And it's, it's very, a quick read, you know. It's not... You know, a lot of rock guys, people who are into rock, maybe not like to read, but this one goes pretty quick, so it's 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 a very quick read. So you say you have all your bases still, or, or they sold your gear, or you still have your guitars? No, I've only got one. I've only got my original one, because they figured that 
because it was the band that paid for my other my other two or three other bases, huh. they cited that the band owned them, you know, so they kept all the stuff. And you know, when things are all done along that kind of way with lawyers involved and everything, you know, there's no sentiment, you know, that's the thing. Yeah, so you had like the th- the Sunburst Thunderbird. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you remember? Yeah, how did you know that? I well, I'm a bass player. I have several. I have several Thunderbirds as well, and I, I always keep track of guys who play Thunderbirds. It's the first one, yeah. The next uh, broken a couple of times. They've been glued together, and uh huh. I have a couple of Thunderbirds like that myself that have the neck broken. It's good, yeah, because the necks are very fragile. That's what's great about Thunderbirds. They're so fragile, aren't they? Yeah, the whole design right. is kind of wrong, really, but and they're so fragile and impractical. That's what I love about them, you know, because uh, aesthetically, I think they're really. Uh, Beautiful, almost like sculptures. Yeah, they look cool. But you take your hands off the neck. If you lift your both your arms up, that thing will go right headstrong into the floor. Exactly, exactly. You got a financial settlement from from the darkness. Did you get enough money to live? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I got a nice financial settlement. But still, you know, I'm still old more. You never get what you deserve. You know, there's still there's forty grand going missing, and there's money going missing there. But I'm happy I got most of it. You know. Because those guys wasted most of, their, most of their money in the second album, you know? Yeah. Is there still money coming in from the darkness, or do they just owe so much from the second album, everybody's kind of kind of broke? In terms of recording royalties, there's nothing really... Uh, but in terms of publishing, you know, you get bits here and there, you know? Right. You think there will ever be a darkness reunion? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure. I doubt it, you know. But, you know, the thing is, there's only one big album, you know? So I'm not sure if... Um, that warrants a reunion. I just, I just, I think that I. First of all, I can't believe they kicked you out because everything was going so good with that first album. And you know, a lot of bands have the second album slump. And if you, and usually if they work through it, and get over that second album hump and do a third record with all original members, usually they end up, they usually end up, you know, coming out good on the other end. It's a shame, isn't it? Yeah, it's, a, it's a shame, really. But you know, in a way, it was short and sweet, and I, I feel very uh, um, delighted because the thing is. Uh, there is no real kind of bands doing that kind of music anymore, you know. Well, there's Love Revolver, maybe, and, you know, but there's no one really doing that kind of really old, old school stuff anymore successfully. So I, I just feel uh, very, very privileged uh, uh, privileged to, to have been involved in that, you know, and to have enjoyed doing that, because that kind of music is just the most fun to play live. Yeah. It's great, great fun. Every gig was just a, like a laugh, you know, and just to be alongside Justin, too. He's a very funny guy, you know. Of course. stage with and, the we guy still have such fun and such a laugh on, on stage, you know. So. The guy was a great singer and a fantastic guitar player. So if they if yeah. they asked you to reunite, would would you do it? I don't know. It's too complicated. I know it sounds like uh, to everyone else it seems quite simple, but you know, and there's a lot of bad will. I think we burned a lot of bridges. You know, Justin kind of said a lot of uh, pissed a lot of people off. You know, in the UK especially. You know, in America, it's probably in the states it's probably a little bit more of a we were obviously much more underground, and we never really became that that big. So um, all the rock community know about us, but so as soon as, as, soon as um, to the mainstream, as soon as something a bit more kind of unusual, oh, the darn is they're a bit quirky. But in the UK, everyone got a bit sick of it, you know, because uh, just in the flag and everyone off in the press, and there was a bit, of, and it became really bloated. You know, the whole thing became bloated. Right. The bloated second album and the self indulgent video. So I believe there's a lot of negative PR around the band, you know, in the UK, and it would have to be like. A, at least another few years and this, everything the whole mindset of the country changed and somehow it became like a charming kind of memory for people exactly possible, I, I, I can't see it you know but anyway you know, you know who knows I mean good luck to Justin you know definitely uh, good, good, good luck to the guy you know he's, he's done his own thing with Hot Leg now and it's um, you know and it's uh, fresh and it's kind of funny and who knows you know Hot Leg might get big yeah, I kind of have a feeling that people are going to be demanding a dark because you know everybody else reunites. I, I have a feeling that people are going to demand a darkness reunion, and I hope you I hope you do it because the band once you left the band, the new guy I know he was the guitar tech, but he did the band just didn't it didn't feel the same without you in the band. Oh, thanks, man. I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate the positivity yeah, and the, the good vibes there. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just the way it is. You know, we, you know. Well, it was a great album, and I think that first album, it was only one album, you know. It's hard to do that kind of music, it's true, but maybe, maybe some of, some young band will come along and kind of uh, carry, the flame, carry the flame of that kind of, you know, classic rock. Classic rock might come back again with something else. Yeah, a lot of people are doing it, but I I really like that, that first album so much. What's your favorite song on that album, that first record? 
my favorite song the first time probably going on me yeah mine too mine too yeah wow yeah yeah, yeah. i just i think it's just uh great it just never stops never stops yeah it's just moving ahead and it's uh, and every section i think is really nice and fresh you know it's, and it's uh, one hook up. after another. Every 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 part of that song is is catchy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's a great melody. It's quite original. It's kind of quite sophisticated music, I think, you know, compared to the other stuff. Yeah, it's, it's also about Jennifer Ward. Everyone thinks it's right. Song, so it's right. Actually, uh, you know, and that makes it cool as well. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, I mean, you know, when we look back, we like to think that we could have done some of the songs better because it was only uh, twenty thousand uh, sterling. Twenty thousand pounds it cost to make. We paid for it ourselves. But it was it was before we got our record deal. In fact, that album was recorded almost yeah, that album was recorded almost a year before we got a record deal. Imagine what would happen if you were to record the second album with the same attitude and the same amount of money. You'd all be rich. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, this is a lesson for everyone. Yeah, why do we? Well, I, I go into it in the book. You know, I make the that's a pay, you know. It's, it's, it's no rocket science, and you know, it's like it's obvious. You know, do what works in the first album. You know, that that's that's what suits you. You know, and, you know, just plug in, kind of, you know, keep it raw. So and that's what went wrong with it in the first place. Cut it raw. I mean, that's why we came like uh, rubbish. And the same with grunge and everything. All all those movements started off uh, raw and with lots of energy. And uh, you know, people in small studios just lost in a gut. You know. Right, and then uh, all, all, all those, music, you know, that's almost every musical uh, kind of genre. Uh, when it comes to electric guitars, anyway, it all starts off uh, raw, and then it ends up bloated and self and buzzing and right. rubbish. Yeah, it is kind of the classic, classic story of a rock band who finds success. You know, it's yeah. You should what? say it's a story of rock music in a way, isn't it? It's a classic story of rock music. I mean, who would have thought? Because. Uh, if you go from, from the Rolling Stones to, to Coldplay, you know, it's, right. like, it's just a massive, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a huge, humongous deterioration. Was that the first band you were in when playing with the Hawkins Brothers? I know you, well, you guys were called Empire or something like that before. Was that the very first band you were ever yeah, in? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, I was in a few different bands. Yeah, I mean, I did, you know, I, got, uh, I mentioned in the book that I took off quite, quite late. I couldn't, uh, bought my first guitar with the proceeds of my uh, drug smuggling, you know. Uh, <laughs> And I make the point that um, uh, that was the uh, um, so that was when I first bought my, my guitar, and then I was in the P bands after that. I spent a lot of time uh, with Dan and Justin because I was in a band called Empire with them, and we we, we met about seven eight years before um, the darkness even started. Yeah, well, Frankie, I thoroughly enjoyed the book, and I hope you have much success with it. You plan on doing any more writing? Um, uh, yeah, I'll do something with something completely different. I won't write on myself anymore as a band as I was in anything like that. I'll write probably in the, in the second person, you know, or the third person even. Maybe a fictional book or yeah. another self-help type book or what? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? I might do a fictional one or something a bit different, you know. How are you making your living now? Are you making enough from the book or do you get enough from the settlement to, to live for a while? Um, <laughs> depends how, how long I live for. Uh, well, yeah, just in a few investments here and there, and uh, um, traveling, and uh, you know, I mean, like you said, in Montanita and Ecuador now, which is great. Um, I like it surfing here and learning Spanish, and um, uh, you know, I think they're starting a business here as well. And uh, you know, if I'm going back to London in a month, and um, there's a band I might manage. Uh, there's a lot of people asking me to, to play with them and stuff, so I might do some stuff. Uh, you know, I might play, but I don't want to play just for the sake of it. I don't want to take a step down, you know. Well, Frankie, I thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been really nice talking to you. It's a pleasure, Mike. Okay, cheers and okay. hi to everyone in San Francisco. Uh, okay, thanks. Good luck in Ecuador, and say hi to, to your Polish cleaner, Anya. Okay. <laughs> okay, bye.